On this episode of My So Called Podcast, we are going back to the week of May 10th, 1996. Right, you are, Gary. And uh, we'll be touching base with uh, Elvis Costello and the Attractions, all this useless beauty album, and watching uh, Jan de Bont's feature, Twister. Like the past. The movie never changes it. Every time you see it, it seems different because you are different. You, you see different things. Welcome to my so-called podcast. I am Gary Linton. As always, I am still Eric Spiegel. But you are Eric always. One day, I hope to, you know, fire up the old Skype. We're still using Skype, and uh, it will not. You you will not be Eric Spiegel anymore. That's uh, and because you'll be somebody better. I don't know. <laughs> Do you think I'll be Anna Kornikova? Uh, she's definitely better than you. And Anna Nicole Smith. <laughs> No, I hope not. She's you know, <laughs> she's shuffled off this mortal coil and uh, has uh, well. I mean, ascended. obviously, in this uh, fairy tale landscape where I've disappeared and you have gotten an Anna for some reason. That's right. Uh, I feel like it could be any era, you know, and a Karenina. Na-na-na. If if only. So yeah, yeah, a fictional character that would be crazy. Yeah, uh, it would be really weird. You yeah. could uh, date. Um, uh, what's her name from Sense and Sensibility, or what's her name from Pride and Prejudice? Right, right. I think I don't want to be, but I believe that Woody Allen wrote a short story. That's why I'm hesitant because it is a Woody Allen short story where, like the the women of classic literature, or uh, mm-hmm. like you'd go in and you'd have affairs with them or something like that. Along those, lines. I mean, it it's, sounds like a great short story, and honestly, yeah. that sort of sexual fantasy is what we love him for exactly yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. um the, the I, don't, sexual, I don't know i the you know what? fantasy with children i don't want to get off into it i just wanted to... to it reminded me of it we don't need to go into him any longer no, i would we just can say move my, on. my two thoughts about woody allen are number one he's a genius i love a lot of his work uh he's hilarious he's insightful existential mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. really challenges morals and ethics and society and in an intelligent way. Uh, okay. And I'm okay with his vulnerability about sexuality. Uh, number two, why did we all just let Manhattan slide? Well, right. Yeah, I think. <laughs> like at the because time. Because he used it as the, a, right. At the time, it still was like, maybe not, everybody. Yeah. I mean, again, the, the character, it's a character flaw in the movie. And so it's like, oh, well, he's he's hanging a lantern on that. He knows it's wrong. And we, but then I, I, I do think a Woody Allen movie where he plays the murderer, but he like justifies it mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm, through mm-hmm. like, oh, I, I, I yeah, I, I lampshaded that. And also, you know, it, aren't we all sinners? Yeah, you know, yeah. kind of a deal. But I've murdered many people. Like, hey, but I'm cool, right? Right. Well, all right. that's what we need. But that's what Manhattan is. He's just like, hey, look at me. I'm a pedophile. No problem, right? It was all that beautiful uh, Gordon Willis cinematography. Is what really? Well, uh... and I think uh, I think a little carryover goodwill from Annie Hall, which doesn't no. have any pedophilia, right? Right. But the, yeah. I mean, Manhattan, besides that whole storyline, is still a... I mean, it is a good movie besides that it was it was really well, good. Yeah, and, which I mean, is, that, that's what that's where our blinders come from yeah. i think right like it's like we love the other parts of it so much right. we're like well th- this couldn't be what it seems like at face value right right 
But that's not okay. This is a podcast where we go back to a week in the nineties <laughs> and we talk about a movie and an album that were released within a week of each other. What are we talking about this week, Eric? Well, Gary, it was the nineteen ninety six May movie mm -hmm. music season. We, you and I, mm -hmm. were about to graduate from high school. That's right. We were already checked out by May tenth. Uh, I was like, Phew. probably not. I didn't take my AP exams yet or anything, so yeah. it was probably pretty stressing actually. Um, but Friday night, uh, the night that Twister came out, I went and saw it, baby. We saw Twister, Yanda Bont's follow up to Speed, uh, and uh, I didn't even really know anything about Elvis Costello, but his uh, All This Useless Beauty came out that right. same week, apparently. Yeah. Well, it came out right. So Twister came out on the Friday, then the next Tuesday, you could have gotten All This Useless. All all this useless beauty by Elvis Costello, and he brings the attractions back for that disc. It's been uh, it had been seven years. We'll talk about that here in a little bit, and then the second half of the podcast, we'll talk about Twister, Jan de Bont's Twister. So, uh, but we like to set the stage uh, of like what was going on in '96. We you already mentioned we were both seniors, and so that's right, yeah. that's right. Uh, uh, maybe we should just do some uh, memory lane here. So you were a senior. Uh, uh, and like, so what was going to happen that summer? What were you looking forward to? Uh, I think uh, just hanging out, being done with uh, being done with high school. You know, I was uh, going to go to Southwest Missouri State University, go Bears, uh, with my friend did, Eric. Did you uh, did you uh, work at Blockbuster that summer? I was or what? working at Blockbuster that summer. So yes. you worked a lot of combina You worked a lot of nights then. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And so you probably slept in a lot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't remember that specifically, but sure. I probably. I mean, I was an eighteen-year-old kid. I slept in a lot. I have had very few jobs in my life that took place outside of the eight to five, nine to five thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that summer after high school, I uh, after senior high school, I, I worked a day camp. So I had to be okay. there at eight. I had to mm -hmm. be there at eight. Got off at five. You know, it was like the Monday through Friday. You're punching in, punching out. Yeah, same old deal. And then um, after that, I worked. Well, I mean, when I went to the when I was in college, it was a free for all. Okay, I, yeah, I didn't yeah. have a job the first three years, so yeah. three, two years or whatever. So it was like, but there was a summer of Domino's Pizza delivery, Gary. That's well, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and summer so of Domino's Pizza delivery. It does feel like like you're in a different world when you don't have to get up on Monday through Friday at at eight or nine mm -hmm, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like you're still working forty hours, but you feel like you're outside the yeah the, you're on the, the mainstream you know yeah different different plane mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well anyhow um uh, that's some good memories from yeah. 1986 yeah. um i will say i saw twister in the theater twice Oof. and i saw it twice in the same house the same theater oh, okay inside a theater so kenrick mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the big the big screen on kenrick if you went in and turned to your right yeah and then you know, two uh, one theater down, and then the second one on your right was the biggest screen. Yeah, at, that's right, at Kenrick. That's right. But they also had a pretty big one if you went to the left, and the second one on your left. Okay. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I still, I, I don't know why my geographic memory works for this, but like I saw the Truth About Cats and Dogs with uh, my very mismatched blind date at um, Kenrick over there on the right. I saw Casino. Uh, on opening day in that same theater that I saw Twister, you know, I guess five months later. And then I went on a double blind date with this girl, Carrie, uh, like, I want to say six days, eight days later to see Twister again. Oh, and I yeah. was like, well, yeah. you should go see Twister again because it's that good. Oh, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> well... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, that's Kenrick Theater, Twister, etc. <laughs> I have a lot of memories. Um, uh, yeah, I kind of blew things up with this Carrie girl because yeah. I thought I had a crush on this other girl, Kelly, who didn't care about me at all. Mm. But it was like, you know, I'm emotionally immature. I'm like 18. Yep. What are you, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? Um, Gary, I think we're gonna skip Total Recall this, I like it. Okay. this episode. Um, 
uh, just because I don't have my phone right now, and oh, I need that to do the song. <laughs> oh, okay. And uh, I think it's cool if we skip it. Like, you know what? If you like Total Recall the game, come back next month for another My So-Called Podcast listeners. We love you. That's right. Um, do you want to tell us what was on the radio? Yeah, these were the singles that were on the radio the same week that Elvis Costello and the Attractions released their album. So this is what you could have heard uh, if you were going to Kendrick uh, Cinema in uh, South uh, County. Uh, Ken- Kenrick. Kenrick, I think. that's right. You're right. Sorry. Uh, Kendrick Lamar, Kendrick Lamar uh, exactly. is the, is the the rapper who uh, beat Drake into his own early grave That's within right. the past three weeks. I, um, wait, and what was the the butcher shop also Kenrick or Kendrick? It was a Kenrick. You know, which I guess it was. Yeah. I think it's both Kenrick. Yeah, because I guess but, it's. But I would give in on the Kendrick butcher if you think that's like no. a Mandela effect, right? But I know Kenrick Eight is Kenrick Eight, Kenrick yeah. eight and, which but, you know, which insult upon insult, Gary is now a freaking Walmart. Yeah, that's right. Like and Kenrick wasn't how, even like a how town. How much worse? Why were there multiple things named Kenrick? I don't know. It's yeah. probably a St. Louis thing that mm-hmm. doesn't make sense. I'm not sure. But it was a good theater. It was sort of like um, Ronnie's was home base. Keller was sort of like uh, was sort of the, the cheap, disrespectful yeah. part of town. And then uh, Kendrick was like my little hidden secret because like, uh, it was you know, back there. Yeah. Yeah, it would just be like, oh, you know what? There's not a 3 p.m. showing of Congo this summer, but I can drive out to Kenrick and there is one, you know, like my little. I, I remember pe- taking people from Arnold to Kenrick and being, them being like, whoa, where are we? Oh, yeah. You know where I was going? In 18, I would have hit the Esquire a lot. I was like, yeah, let's go. Because I thought that was, you know, Parkmore, Esquire. That's what I was doing at 18 that summer. Shh. You better believe it, man. Go to the Parkmore after the Esquire. Yeah. That is a good night. Get yourself a shake, a burger, talk over the movie. And then I remember uh, heading up to uh, Olive, West Olive, a lot, because that was the big theater there, too. I think that was even bigger than Kenrick or Ronnie's at that time. Yeah, that is now a theater that is just sitting there empty. Yeah. It is a theater that nobody owns. It's just sitting there in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. It's really weird. I My theory is... Of course, like, still uh, there, though. I feel like... Um, yeah, Creep Core, yeah. What, what, seven miles east? Yeah, that was crazy um, that they made those, but yeah. Um, but I think that one out in West Olive could probably be like an Alamo where you have some like theme nights and weird showings and like uh, mystery science theater kind of things. Like, oh, right. if it's just sitting there, Gary, let's do it. Let's do it. But before we do that, here are the songs that were on the radio the same week that uh, All This Useless Beauty came out. Number 10, Down Low, Nobody Has to know by somebody I don't want to talk about, but featuring Ronald Isley. So, oh, okay. So yeah. Ronald Isley had a big hit exactly. this year. Exactly. No, no Good. Ten. Thanks for letting us know. Uh, number nine, Count on Me by Whitney Houston and CC Winnings. Winnings, I guess. I don't know this song, man. Do you think it's from The Preacher's Wife or Waiting Ooh, to Exhale? Yeah, or... Probably, probably. Yeah, it was a soundtrack. Bodyguard. Album, man, well. she had some soundtracks in yeah. the mid 90s. Bodyguard, not on 1996. Count on Me. Uh, probably not Preacher's Wife either. No, no it's doing pre- preacher's wife versus waiting to exhale is yeah. my question i know that bodyguard is 92 93 okay uh number eight tracy chapman's cover of give me one reason right it's her cover of <laughs> no i think it's just her song what oh okay yeah that's right give me one reason to no, stay I get, here. Uh... I don't even know the guy that did the version recently, but he gives her plenty of credit. I'm not trying to say. He's always... Oh, you're saying this might have been some sort of a time-traveling cover of the new guy's thing? Yep, yep. Look, Um, now you're my teacher in uh, high school. You can't see me, but you can see my ceiling. (laughs) Yep. Uh, That's great. Uh, Number seven, one, two, three, four, uh, something new by our... R.I.P. Coolio. Coolio. R.I.P. Oh. Rest in power. Oh, didn't you see Coolio like four days before his death? It wasn't four days. It was a couple of months. But yeah, it was. Uh, um, he died the after. It was like a month or two after performing in St. Louis for at the Fourth of July uh, thing, and uh, 
Yeah, I think it was that he he was complaining about how hot it was. So it was like, oh, Coolio, you need a Coolio from the St. Louis Heat. It's the humidity, I guess, that gets you. Number six. No, I I feel like um, like I feel like we all need to have a reckoning and realize that Gary killed Coolio. <laughs> That's right. Uh, uh, the podcast is over. We're done. We're done. <laughs> this is now a true crime podcast oh, about go. how Gary killed Coolio. I mean, and if this is how I, I mean, I'm not saying I did, but if I did, this is how I would have killed Coolio. <laughs> so, uh, no, I would have, I would have definitely showed up <laughs> after going to McDonald's and then nearly decapitated Coolio exactly. and, and some random dude he was with <laughs> and then lied about it forever until I died. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Uh, number six, uh, You're the One by SWV, those sisters with voices. Do you know this one? Um, yeah. I think it's, uh, You're the One I Run To. Um, that is a different sister. <laughs> oh, yeah, but she does have a voice. <coughs> this one goes like this. I'm gonna I, sing I, it I don't, to you. I don't hear anything, Eric. Goes you're like, the one for me. You're the one. It goes like that. Oh, yeah. It, I do remember it now. <laughs> uh, number five is Nobody Knows by Tony Rich Project. Oh, I know this very much. Uh, I got a memory of this song. It was Amanda was a sophomore who worked at the day camp with me. Mm -hmm. So she was going to be a sophomore. I was going to be a freshman. And so she was like taking me under her wing or Aww. whatever. But, you know, no romantic tension, nothing. Sure. She actually was dating the boss, actually, weirdly enough. Oh, uh, that's uh, problematic. I mean, it was 1996, Gary. I'm just reporting the news. Yeah. Um, but she liked that song a lot. And uh, we went to see our friend Stephanie Busher, who uh, a friend of the show, Paul Wigman, had a big crush on uh, in high school. Because uh, she had a soccer game, but it was in Fulton, Missouri. So we, like, drove out to Fulton from Columbia to watch Stephanie play in a soccer game. Okay. And the uh, whole time there, man, 100% Tony, Tony Rich, Rich Project. Project. Yeah, and she had, like, the EP, so it was, like, this song and, like, four remixes of this song. Wow. So it was, like, and nobody knows it but me, not so long. I always got Jesus the upset. Tony Rich Project confused with the Manhattan yeah, Project. Thinking about so little, thing that we had. So, embarrassing. so weirdly enough, um, uh, at the Manhattan Project out in <laughs> uh, uh, New Mexico, yeah. uh, they started to get um, kind of bored on the weekends. And they they invited Tony the Tony Rich Project <laughs> out because they were both projects they could understand one another and uh, they created a little saloon where the Tony Rich Project could sing their one song. <laughs> Not so lonely the days are so sad. And Oppenheimer he would just strip down to his underwear and think about Florence Pugh and no, groove. Just, not just that he just <laughs> sit in the chair naked, totally naked. Yeah. <laughs> um, he would be like, oh, I'm so tortured with my relationship ships with Florence Pugh and Emily Blunt. My right. life is so hard. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> that sounds like old Oppie. Uh, okay, number four that week was Ironic by Alanis Morissette. I don't, I'm not familiar with that song. Yep. I think you have a, a, a visitor back there. Uh, number Whoa! two, number three that week Owen's on the was, podcast. Yeah. Come on in, buddy. Uh, What's up, guys? How's it hey, going? Hey, Owen. Hi. I was just trying to grab some chips. Oh, okay. Um, that's cool. Uh, do you have anything to say about the movie Twister? Ooh, it's a great portrayal of uh, life in the American Midwest. Okay, um, so um, there's a movie coming out this summer called Twisters. Right, It's right. the 2024 that. sequel to this 1996 movie. The trailer is really straight to the point. It's like, there's a tornado. Yeah, so of... as a, a young man that wasn't alive during Twister, um, what is your interest level of Twisters? Approximately zero. Oh, mm. zero. Mm. Approximately, okay. Approximately. Like, not, Even though it's got the I girl from uh, me, uh, Normal People in it? Mm. Never watched that. I just read the book. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. Owen Spiegel, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me. All right. Uh, you're, right so, you're right. He couldn't hear you. No, Sorry, he Gary. Okay. I, next time I'll try to figure that out. No, we it's a all guest right. Star. Uh, number three is Because You Loved Me by Celine Dion. 
So um, I just learned recently that this up close and personal movie, which we should definitely do for the podcast, mm-hmm, by the way, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. is a really interesting Hollywood story of like it was based on a really kind of harrowing real news story of a death and problems and ethics quandaries. And, and then it, they just turned it like revision over revision over revision into just a romantic drama with Michelle Pfeiffer and Robert Redford, which, yeah. I mean, excuse me, but like Michelle Pfeiffer and Michael Keaton in Cat Suit and Bat Suit, mm-hmm. fine. Yeah, yeah. What the hell is Robert Redford doing here? For I mean, like maybe Robert Redford in 1975 could be a suitor yeah. for Michelle Pfeiffer in 1996, oh. but gross me out. Yeah. And then the movie didn't portray the person very well. So anyway, uh, we should watch that movie and I will try to pretend I didn't say any of the things I just said yeah, about that. Yeah, you don't need to watch it. You just, uh, you just. No, uh, no, 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 no. I want to. I, I want to dig into the uh, the woman that it was supposed to be based on, who seems like an interesting person. So mm, okay. So it went from a biopic to a not gr- biopic. Not biopic. Yes. Yeah. Number two that week was Always Be My Baby by Mariah Carey. Well, shit, man. That is a jam. Yep. That is that is maybe number one or two Mariah Carey song, but it's problematic because fantasy is mm. also amazing. So it's really hard. It depends on the mood I'm in. But okay. like as far as pure pop gold goes, uh, Always Be My Baby and fantasy are incredible Here's pop songs. I mean, I, I'm just saying like in the 90s, we didn't have a whole lot of like like pure pop wonderment like uh the 80s had but yeah right carrie sometimes hit that when she wasn't doing ballads she, she was it. making these sweet sweet jams that's right number one that week was the crossroads by bubba bones thugs in harmony yep what is your experience with the bone thugs there gary uh you know i don't have much experience uh, other than what these uh, you know the songs that got played on the radio that i heard they get too much play um yeah i kind of feel like at this point in my life i was a little bit closed off to hip-hop and um Mm. and that kind of a thing so it's hard for me to really talk about the bone thugs because i i didn't like it back then but at the same time i kind of was predisposed to sort of being not interested in this sort of a thing i had a couple of friends who were uh, big into the hip-hop so i you know they would play what they played like you know i heard all the snoop dogs uh doggy uh, style back in the day because uh, he played in the car while we were driving around. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and yes, I had did not have that friend. Yeah, uh, Alicia had that friend actually. It was our friend Karen. Yeah, who had uh, I want to say maybe like thirty CDs from that uh, gangster rap period. Essentially, yeah. I'm not sure if Bone Thugs qualifies as gangster rap though. No, I don't think so either because uh, they're I all about the harmony. So. Bone Thugs in harmony. Oh, okay. And gangsters, they don't like harmony. No. Wait, I need I'm gonna need to watch Scarface again. Gary. Okay. Yep, you do that. Okay. I need to check in with Dr. De Palma's views on these matters. Yes. Do uh <laughs> all right, so those were the songs that were on the radio the same week that Elvis Costello uh, got the old attractions back together to release all this useless beauty. Eric. Yeah, it was a real blues brothers situation. That's right. They're getting the band back together. Okay, Gary, uh, Elvis Costello has a lot of really good albums mm-hmm. and songs. Mm-hmm. Um, either you feel like uh, there's some good songs on this album or, or you feel like this is not a song, an album that has good songs on it. <laughs> I mean, there are some good songs on this album. <laughs> so, okay, let's do... I agree. I No, that wasn't the leading question. Yep. I think there's some actually really good songs on this album, so don't take that personally. I yep. was just wondering if you hated the whole thing. It's not, a, it's not a, to me, it's not a great album altogether. No, I agree. But there are some gems, I think, maybe, yeah. on this. So, okay, let me tell you, I'll set the history. Stage. I, I kind of want to do some stage setting here with Elvis Costello. You uh-huh. know, he's came out post punk, kind of. Uh, he came out with his first album. It had uh, um, Every Day I Write the Book. Or no, Allison. Allison was on his first album. Allison. Yep. And then. I uh, know. 
this world is killing you. And that, I believe, he the backing band for that was, um, I think, like even like Huey Lewis was uh, played on that one because. Uh, wow, that is a cool fact. I yeah. did not know that. Um, I'm gonna go check this out real quick. Clover Band, uh, which was like from Valley. Yeah, Huey Lewis in the news. Yeah, and they backed up uh, Elvis Costello. My aim is true. Okay, that's all true. I'm not. I'm not BSing you. Okay, I checked my facts real time. But then he got his own band together that he's like, I, I want to. And he got um, Bruce Thomas, Pete Thomas, Bruce Thomas on bass, Pete Thomas on drums, and Steve Na- Naive on uh, piano, and released a bunch of great albums. Like, uh, and well, I can't think of any of the albums now. Armed Forces, uh, Get Happy is a great album, and it's all you know, punk, post punk greatness. Uh, and then he kind of mellowed out, uh, and then the. Uh, Kind of. Yeah. Well, what do you mean, kind of? I mean, I just feel like he definitely mellowed out. Yes. Like, he doesn't come across as punky in the 80s, really, or the late 80s at all. Well, right. 86 was the last Elvis Costello and the Attractions album. The bass player, uh, Bruce Thomas, was basically like, I don't think I can play with you anymore. And Elvis Costello was like, well, that's good. I can't play with you anymore. But Pete Thomas, the drummer, and Steve Naive, the piano player, I can't play with you guys were the imposters now that was got to hell on the imposters right yes that's true that's a good point and, after that i never thought about that and then um but in 1996 he was like well yeah i think i Bruce, I do want to have you back. Let's try it. One more album. And they were actually, even before they recorded this, I think they were touring a little bit uh, before that. And so then they did play this album. And this album is all songs that were, um, he wrote for other artists. Well, not all of them, but the majority of them were songs. He yeah, wrote for other it was artists. supposed to be a theme album yes. originally, yes. which was, I wrote a bunch of good songs for other artists. Now I'm going to like reverse cover them. Right. And but so there's also some new stuff on here, yes, right? Yes, yes. And but and I, I, my expectations, I had not listened to this album, but I, you know, but I knew it was he got the attractions back together, and they were the songs like he wrote for other things. So I was just like him. in the Blues Brothers, they yes. got the attractions back together. They went on a lot of crazy car chases. They played in some saloons in the deep south. Right. Some some nuns hit them all with well, a ruler. Right. And so he made a country album called. Uh, almost blue and he took those like some of them are true uh country renditions but then some of them are country songs gone through the post-punk attractions kind of feel and that's what i was kind of hoping this would be would be like all right yeah i got the attractions let's do it uh but no this was not that album (laughs) oh yeah i so i didn't come to this with any expectations but the first four or five songs are just sort of like it feels like he's warming up yes 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 like i feel like uh it's very pleasant i mean i like it whenever it's like piano and melody and elvis costello's voice i mean bring it on like that it, there's nothing you know that's not pleasurable to me about like a real mediocre elvis costello song mm-hmm. like I, I i listen to that all day long but i do feel like i was waiting for this album to be anything other than just sort of like what i already knew about him i guess yeah well that's but and that's what i was hoping it was kind of a, a throwback to his late 70s early 80s but i guess i didn't read it well the, i it. think all you think think some of the more rocking ones are i mean they're yes. a little more heavily produced than something like allison which sounds like it was recorded on like somebody's uh car phone or something right but like uh uh some of these rockers on this album i feel like are pretty fun um but the faster the song the better i kind of liked it but did you like the shallow grave one yeah the, that's paul mccartney it, paul, paul, yeah co-written with paul mccartney that one's yeah. fine yeah it's fine Fine. Yeah. No. Uh huh. What did you think of that one? I do like it. Yeah. It's kind of weird and fun. Track um, number one. Sorry to uh, you can come back to Shallow Grave, but track number one was co-written with Amy Mann. Okay. I mean, like 
I, I guess that's a, a good point, I guess. Like, that makes sense to me, and I love Amy Mann. Yep. But I feel like the Venn diagram of Amy Mann and Elvis Costello ends up being kind of dull, well, maybe. Well, she got the better song that they're, they wrote, those two, Like, the um, the world's greatest optimist or whatever. Off oh, the fall, of, the, the fall, fall of the world's yeah, greatest optimist. That's the but, other one they wrote. And she, right. Well, he yeah. sings on that, right? On the... Uh, 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 on Bachelor Number Two, does he sing on yeah, that? Yeah, I think okay. so. Yeah. I think so. Well, talk about a great album, though, yep, Gary. That is I mean, a good one. that album. I listened to the hell out of that album. I had it was like my only album that uh, only had cardboard. Like there was no plastic to mm-hmm, it, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so it was always like falling apart because I was constantly taking it out of there right. and putting it in. Uh, I mean, I listened to, I, and I was like a snob about it too, because I was like, I bought Bachelor Number Two. I didn't buy the Magnolia soundtrack. That's you right. suckers! But then you, you didn't know. get you didn't get uh, Amy Mann's version of One or and, you, Save, and me. Sa- or Save Me. Right. Save Me was the first thing I downloaded off of uh, Napster oh, when nice. I had Napster because nice. that because I wanted that so bad, but not bad enough to buy the Magnolia soundtrack. Mine was she's so cold by the Rolling Stones? Oh. Because it's like a hard to get track or whatever. No, it was just like I don't want to get that album. I just want that song. Oh, okay, okay. I like it. Yeah. I like it. Yeah, uh, I got that, and then I got uh, a song I really like by <laughs> the band Sugar Ray. Oh yeah. Um, um, and now I can't remember. It's a the good uh, thing about Napster. Just a... uh, uh, anyway, it was a song. It was like their third single up their second album or something, and it's like I'm not gonna buy a sugar ray album but yeah. i do like this song i love this song so it's like nobody can tell i've got it off of napster <laughs> that's right but then when i figured i could burn cds off of my napster playlist i was like man i'm the king of the universe that's right. <laughs> go ahead what were i you was saying? able to get i uh best thing i love it was i downloaded all the uh bur- blur b-sides and oasis b-sides because I was kind of they those were out there and I was like yeah uh, they don't sell those over here in America so I'm gonna go ahead and download the B sides. I mean I'm sure I've told this story before but my big thing um, when I learned that I could go to the record store downtown Columbia from I could walk to it from my dorm and not only do they have you know the same kind of records that like you know Blockbuster Music would have or whatever mm-hmm. but they also had like rare CDs. Oh. And I was like, oh, shit, rare CDs. So then it would be like these illegal Oasis Uh uh, live discs or like um, sort of cobbled together B-sides and stuff. And it would be like kind of be kind of janky. It wouldn't sound totally right. Right. But it was like and it would be like nine songs on a disc for twenty six ninety nine because they knew like some dork was going to buy it. That's right. And then Noel Gallagher or Liam, it was probably Liam, walked in and saw that and was like, we got to release the master plan. Plan. We got to put our own B-side compilation out, right? But the master plan doesn't even have all of the best no, B-sides. No, right? It does not. It's weird. Like, make it like two CDs. Like, we need our like. I don't know. Is Rocking Chair not on there? Or I don't think it is. What the hell? Yeah. There's so many ones. Uh, sad song. The uh, hidden space. track off of uh, the second, uh, the first freaking album that is like right. amazing. It's not on there. Uh, do you want to be a spaceman? Is not on a. Uh... Uh, master right. plan. Right. Listen, I could make a like better than anything other than the first. Okay, so you got uh, Oasis's first album, and then yes. their second album, Morning Glory, and then after that, it's like all the albums are sort of hogwash except for a few songs, yeah, as we all yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. But I could make a album that's better than anything but the first two albums off of the B sides they didn't include on the master <laughs> plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and speaking of B sides. Sides. That's what this Elvis Costello album kind of feels like. Sure, sure, it's... sure. It does. It feels. Um, it feels like he's sitting in a rocking chair or That's something. Right. Like yeah. I don't feel like he's trying to uh, rock my world. And 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 it it is sort of telling. Uh, he's just not in the zeitgeist at this point. Well, I think so. He's coming back because he did. Uh, what was he in? No, I don't think it was Burt Bacharach uh, in Austin Powers. Lady Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bill Bacharach. <laughs> right, like right before his death. <laughs> exactly. And he's like he's like playing the piano in the back of the car. That's right. But Elvis Costello and Burt Bacharach, I think, were doing something.
something. They uh, did work yeah, together. Yeah, they were yeah. doing something around the time too. And I honestly feel like that's always been sort of one of my beefs with Elvis Costello is he went from being like so punk and yep. rock yep. and raw yeah. to being like working with Burt fucking Bacharach. It's like the uh, Lady Gaga, Tony Bennett thing. Yeah. It's like, what? Right. <laughs> yeah, I think... I'm not as into the Bacharach era Costello is all I'm saying. Well, same. And so, and I think that's what kind of hurts this album a little bit is because like he recorded these songs or well, he wrote them for other artists and he kind of does them. He doesn't do them like Elvis Costello and the Attractions. He's doing them like these other no, artists. No, but what's, what's your favorite song on the album? Uh, on the album, probably, oh, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Uh, do you have a favorite song? So you bowed down. Yeah, that has a huge, big start to it. Sort of a, a wall of sound production. Yeah, yep, yep. And uh, it kind of comes in and out on the song. And I wouldn't say the song's like a hundred percent catchy as hell, but like the the production is great and it sounds fun. It's at least like I can hear something other than him and his piano on that one. Yeah. And uh, but I started to get That's to it. a few of these that I felt pretty strongly that they would but would have stood out maybe i don't know if it had been sequenced differently or they were on a different album but it really starts off as a slog and then so sort of the back half of the album i feel like has some good finds but right. uh yeah it's even hard like to get the title track all this useless beauty is kind of like uh yeah it's just it's, like you know what i think that's yeah. just that that title was just too pretentious to not be the title of the album yeah 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 but it's not that good as Song. No, it's a uh, yeah, right, right. You should listen to "You Bowed Down" twice instead of that one. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but I really like. It's got some nice chimey guitars and huge bass and drum set. Like well, I guess that, the, that's, the, the, that's the attractions. I guess. Yeah, right? yeah. Bruce Thomas, bass player for the attractions. I mean, he's great. He like if you listen to uh, Oliver's Army or like anything yes, he's doing. I will on, do that. Yeah. Just or the whole Get Happy album. Listen to that, and um, yeah, it's just like bass in your face, and <laughs> it's great. Yeah, I like that. I think I, honestly, I guess my preference is for Elvis Costello's voice to have a real solid um, band around it because then it becomes sort of unique sounding. Mm -hmm. It's obviously not you know going to carry this song always, especially like several songs in a row where it's just his voice. It's like I don't know. It's just it's it's almost too singular to not have other stuff going on. Maybe does that make sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. Get Happy has uh, that song High Fidelity on it. Uh, that's a, that's a very quality yeah. song. Uh, right at. I, yeah. I always like what's so funny about Peace, Love, and Understanding. Yeah, that's, that's a really a good, good song. So. Um, yeah, okay. Well, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's all this useless beauty. I don't have too much I mean, to say. There's for some it. really, really good songs on it. Honestly, I feel like give it a listen and, uh, take note of the ones you don't care for and maybe be like, save a playlist of the three or four really good ones and there i feel like they stand out the first time you listen to them so if you like him i would not skip this album especially since we can all listen to whatever we want all the time that's now. right yep um so i would listen to the this album one way through and uh, uh pick out the ones you like because there's some there's some good ones I, it, there's actually not a bad song on no this album. i mean they're they're all professionals that's the thing so they know yeah. how to make it and it's just i think my expectations were a little higher and I should have. I mean, I need them. I need some transcendental moments from yeah. my Elvis Costello, and it doesn't happen as much here. That's right. All right. Well, so we have a rating system. You know, we have to rate other people's work, uh, and we do it on stars. Right, because Gary, you know, we're qualified to do this because we've never done anything of importance. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, uh, oh, four stars is our scale. I'm gonna give all this useless beauty two stars i maybe two and a half but i have two I mean, yeah I, i'm gonna so you give it two i'll give it three and we'll split the difference as if we both give it two and a half because i feel like uh like i said there's nothing bad happening here no, there's a yeah. few good ones uh it it your mileage may vary based on how much you like elvis costello obviously well, but uh, you, yeah exactly i think what 
and I guess expectations. Like I said, I was expecting. This earlier. is more like uh, this is more like uh, what's that album with the landslide on it? Pisces Iscariot. Oh, for Smashing it, Pumpkins, yeah. Yeah, it's it's more like a Pisces Iscariot as opposed to like a melancholy and the infinite sadness. Uh, daydream. Uh, no, it's, uh, what's that? What's there... Siamese dream. Dream. Siamese dream. That's right. Yep. Well, and a lot a lot of people really like their first album too. What's that called? Gish. Gish, yeah. That that's apparently the one that the real fans like. That's right. Uh okay, well we're gonna take a break. All right. Yeah, let's take a break. Go to the bathroom, yep. get a bubbly water. Yep. You know what I'm talking about, Gary. Yeah. And we'll come back, we'll talk about Jan de Bont's Twister. Uh, you know when uh Sideshow Bob steps on a rake? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That the noise he makes, that's my review of Twister. Uh. <laughs> All right. Scientists have been studying tornadoes forever, but still nobody knows how a tornado works. Yeah, touchdown, touchdown. Tornado is on the ground. Woo-hoo! It's the wonder of nature, baby! These sensors take scientific measurements. You gotta get in front of the tornado and put it in the damage pad. You've gotta get further ahead of it. I know what I'm doing. Have you lost your nerve? Tighten your seatbelt. trailer for twister that's what that was oh i didn't realize uh for some reason i'm having a hard time hearing myself gary oh i'm sorry about that i don't know if uh, in the middle of the podcast is when we should troubleshoot that <laughs> oh you know what i i uh, i'll deal with it uh on my end i'm just letting you know okay. i'm just glad you could hear the beauty and the glory of that trailer i was uh, yeah it came through and um yeah so that was twister released uh a couple of days before elvis castello's all this useless beauty uh and eric you went and saw it in the theater i don't remember if i saw i must have saw it in the theater i had to but i don't remember um I mean, it seems really strange uh, that 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 you wouldn't have. No, I mean, it I was mean, a huge deal yeah. at the time. It was like it would you would have almost been making a statement right. of some sort to not go to see Twister. Um, I want to say because you know it was um, it was uh, kind of a uh, the the beginning of the summer movie That's kind of right. deal, yeah. right? It was yep. so early. I remember there there hadn't been too many early may and, summer movies and, and this was very early right and 18 i just loved going to the movies and i had a disposable income because i was working and so and I'm nothing sure I to, and exactly. nothing to do and my, yeah, yeah. sometimes yeah my high school girlfriend was willing to go see movies with me although i don't think we saw this one because i remember actually i do remember talking to her about it afterwards and i don't think we saw it together because uh i was like that was really d- i must have saw it with my brother friend of the podcast greg um yeah i went to see it okay i guess before we start talking about what was out at the at the box office i'll tell you my twister story i what? guess it's probably been told on the podcast but i probably told should it at tell the beginning it. Feel we like... saw it twice yeah, but so the first time I didn't go into detail. Are, are you okay with hearing this scary um, again? Yeah, yeah. 
All right. So all my friends and I... Oh, you know what? Now I can't remember. Oh, this is weird. This is Mandela effect. Mm -hmm. I feel like... Okay, so if you've listened to the Mission Impossible podcast, you've heard this story because they're connected. I saw them like one week after the other at Kenrick. So whenever I saw Twister, I saw the girl that worked there, Wendy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I talked to her while we were buying tickets. Yes. And et cetera, et cetera. Had fun with all my guys, a group of 10 guys, whatever. Then we come back to see Mission Impossible, same movie theater, same group of friends. And Wendy's working there. But Mm -hmm. this time we hung out afterwards and I asked her on a date. That's right. So that was, uh, I mean, it does add a veneer of good memories to the uh, Twister Mm -hmm. Mission Mm -hmm. Impossible Um, but there you go Uh, would you like to hear like like, say for example Gary you were like I've already seen Twister I want to go see a movie what else is out yep you go see the Paul Bear. Oh, I did not go see uh, that in the theater. Harvey Weinstein's Gwyneth Paltrow and uh, David uh, Schwimmer. David Schwimmer, yeah. sort of a graduate. Uh, yeah, yeah. Kind of a movie. Uh, original Gangsters. Uh, that is made by Orion Pictures. Uh, okay. It's opening up. Uh, I don't know. It's. A, I think it's about gangsters. <laughs> uh, gangsters. Num- number eight is uh, James and the Giant Peach. Oh, I the, did go see that in the theater with my high school girlfriend. Uh, did you guys both appreciate uh, the the Dolliverse? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Number seven, The Great White Hype, uh, with uh, I think Samuel Jackson and Michael. Rappaport. Uh, is that not? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, was gonna I think have, that's right. Right. Mar- not Damon Wayne's and um, because he was in a boxing one also. Hmm. Damon Wayans was. Yeah. And you're not thinking of um scary movie. No. Yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> no, you're right. Yeah. The oh, last Boy Scout. So maybe I am thinking of this one. So the Great White Hype stars Samuel Jackson, Peter Berg. Damon Waynes, Jeff Goldblum, John Lovitz, no Michael Rappaport. Wow, it turns out you're right and I'm wrong about this. Why did I think Michael Rappaport was in that movie? Yeah, what? I think he is in a boxing movie, though. I also. think I'm, maybe I'm confusing Peter Berg for Michael Rappaport. Okay, but, you know, my apologies to white guys everywhere. That's right, that's right. Um, the other movie you could go see was The Birdcage, which uh, I'm just going to tell you right now is the only certifiable huge, huge hit on this list. It was out for 10 weeks at this point. So it was like a Christmas movie that's still out uh, in May. It's made $115 million at this point. Still making $1.6 this weekend. Gary, uh, number Ma- five. Michael is Rappaport a- was a boxer in Mighty Aphrodite. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, I never saw The Great White Hype, and I did see Mighty Aphrodite. So that checks out that I would Mandela those two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Number five, The Quest, which is a PG. 13 movie uh, starring John claude Van Damme. I'm not sure what his quest is. Probably to do the splits. To get more. I would guess. Yeah, exactly. To, or to make money. <laughs> <laughs> the quest to take your money from you. Exactly. Number four, Primal Fear. Mm. Um, and they say movies didn't have twists before M. Night Shyamalan, That's Gary. Right. But uh, they yeah, did. It's a twist. Number three, The Craft. Uh, probably one of the most iconic uh, cult movies on this list today. Yeah, uh, the previous cra- My So Called podcast. We yeah, The Craft, I think, is still pretty beloved, even though it wasn't a huge hit. And guess where I saw it, Gary? Uh, at uh, Kenrick, uh, Kenrick Ken- Lamar, Ken- Ken- Kendrick, K. Ken- Dot Lamar Cinemas. It was the big one on the left. Yeah. Um, I also saw Alien Resurrection there. Mm. Um, uh, number two, the truth about cats and dogs. Man, it's Kenrick night. That's uh, the date I went on with Wendy. Uh, did you uh, ever find out the truth about cats and dogs? I think I learned that Uma Thurman is tall and beautiful, yeah. and Janine Graffalo is charming and shorter with dark hair. That's right. That's and what it was. There, there might be a man in it. <laughs> yeah, isn't it the guy from uh, um, Lost He's like City? Australian or uh, 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 or New Zealander or something? I think, uh, he was um, 
Sure. Anyway, I don't remember the guy. Number one, Gary. So the truth about cats and dogs is number two. Okay, and it made three point eight million dollars in its third week of release. So it's kind of a hit romantic comedy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But it made three million dollars. Twister opens with forty one million dollars <laughs> on twenty four hundred screens, which is seventeen grand a screen. It is a certified blockbuster yeah. right out of the gate. It I mean, busted those blocks. Huge, huge. So to make uh, some sort of a financial... Uh, I, I follow the trades and the entertainment weeklies very closely at this point, Gary, but... I will tell you, this is a huge hit because the number one opening of all time ever at this point was uh, Jurassic Park with 65 in 1993. And nothing has come close up until this point. But Twister, which is also a Spielberg production, I think. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah. Um, not, a, not any other creative heat like money only, but it's still yikes. Um, but a huge, huge hit. Um, at the number number one slot, uh, no matter what, it's hard to ignore those numbers. That's right. Uh, okay, so a little bit of background about Twister is it originated like the seed of the movie came from Industrial Light Magic showing how they were able to do these tornado effects, and Spielberg was like, "I don't know if it." What was do you mean Spielberg. the seed of the movie? It's the whole freaking movie. Exactly. Well, there's nothing else to it. Well, exactly, and so they then they got Michael Crichton to write the script, and they. I mean, Spielberg I mean, maybe on gonna... cocaine or something. Yeah. I don't know because what. Whatever. And uh, so I guess either it's a good idea to base your movie around a or to start a movie from a uh, CGI demonstration or maybe think of a better way to come up with a movie idea. I mean, the thing is, it's the absolute correct financial decision, <laughs> obviously, because right. I, rem I mean, I, I had the same reaction to Twister, I think, that I did when I saw Transformers, the Michael Bay movie, the first one, mm -hmm. was like... Well, right, I think... It really looks like real tornadoes in this movie. We like, they that... really look real. Did we see that together? We saw Transformers together, I think. Uh, with Paul Wegman? Was the, were you with uh, You were with Paul. I was in Utah, I think. Oh, okay, okay. But I felt like I was very satisfied because it was very loud and it really looked like trucks turned into robots. Like, it didn't look phony at all. Like, for some reason, there was this period of CG where it's like, oh, it looks pretty damn good now. Um, but I really felt like these tornadoes, I, really, I felt like I went to the movie theater in May in the Midwest, and it was tornado season. Mm -hmm. And it was stormy all the time, just like it has been this May. Well, actually. right, which is why I, I, this movie popped into my head and why we're doing it for this podcast. It's because of that. And, and there's a lot lot of nice sort of helicopter shots of fields of corn and the storms approaching and the tornadoes approaching that it does sort of have a nice vibe about it and honestly the tornadoes look great um <laughs> i do not have anything else good to say about this movie no. do you let's can you no. say some good things before we start tearing it a new asshole because it's no. very bad no i can't say any i mean i guess uh lois smith is great you know as always she's a great actress in all the small parts that she's in but she does she's... always sort of play a cool ant figure exactly and mm -hmm. and even though she's kind of dumb um uh let's see i guess you know the todd field I mean, I... does a fine job before okay, he goes I... and directs the <laughs> lydia tar documentary <laughs> <clears throat> or in the bedroom, bro. Yep. That's his crowning achievement. Uh, and, I was trying to make the... a joke about the tar being a documentary, but that's okay. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, can I tell you, did I tell you about the uh, Hey Randy tar thing? <laughs> no. So I told you what Hey Randy is, yes, right? Yes, I know Hey Randy. Okay, so uh, they had somebody call in for advice, and they just told the story of the plot of the movie Tar. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and nobody it was so early it was like right when it first came out so like nobody on the show knew that it was really tar, tar. So they were like yep. giving advice yeah and so then it was like the next episode and it's like it's come to our attention that this was just tar <laughs> <laughs> and then like if anybody uh, writes in with weird advice questions they're like is this tar again <laughs> Uh, and, and, wait, no, okay, Gary. Here's the deal. Yeah. I'm gonna tell you the best part of this movie. I'm gonna ru- I'm gonna lock it down right okay. here. Okay. All right. There is a part of this movie I don't remember how they got there. It's totally a non sequitur, but everybody in the movie is all of a sudden at a drive-in. Yeah. Oh, and yeah, I, yeah, yeah. They don't even explain yes. why yeah. at all that they're there, but it doesn't matter to me because number one, it's the most exciting scene in the movie. The only reason I feel like like people do not think that this is like an all timer cinematic uh, scene uh-huh. is because the rest of the movie around it is such garbage yeah. that you don't care about the characters. But if this scene, this drive in scene, I think was the opening scene of the movie, it would be very riveting yeah. because you don't hate the characters already or yeah, whatever. Right. And you're not yes. like mad at the movie. Mm-hmm. But um, the shining is yes, playing. That's right. I wrote that the, too. The, the best part of the movie scene. is the shining clip i wrote yeah that. the exactly. best part of the movie is like, the shining clip yeah and he does himself no favors by showing the shining because you're like oh yeah good movie exactly yeah but at the same time you know spielberg actually does the same thing in ready player one he mm. borrows the shining that's right um and i do think that the shining on a screen getting destroyed by a tornado as jack's going through the door with the axe like that's that is pretty awesome yes. like i do think yes. That that is an amazing cinematic image that somebody came up with. I don't know who, but like for him to be, you know, I mean, obviously the 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 motion of the camera as it follows the axe in that scene is yeah. like is the is the you know brilliance of Kubrick. It's like his camera is so still, but then it follows the head of the axe in that scene, and right. so you feel it like chunking into the wall. But then the tornado is destroying the screen at the same time, right. and then. And they're inside that thing, and it's got these huge metal discs that get pulled off oh, one by they're one. They're just like hubcats, I think, is what they are, weren't they? Yeah, I mean, I feel like the uh, the movie is at its strongest when it comes to, and I mean, the, it's at its strongest when it resembles the footage from some sort of a, a ride or something. Yeah, like it's, yeah. it's never a human movie about people, oh. but it does give some sensations of interest, and I, I do feel like this sequence uh, devoid of any characterization is really kind of brilliant um, I just I guess I'm super perplexed that this is the same Jan de Bont that directed the uh, uh, brilliant speed which yep. I feel like is a you know a 10 out of 10 uh, action movie with like a meld of a disaster movie to it yeah and and the disaster movie brilliance of speed is that there's all these interesting people and they're all all really important and Sandra Bullock's job is just as important as Keanu Reeves job he's the hero but he's he's more important that he you know has these relationships with these other people who are also important the guy that pulls a gun on him, on everybody because he thinks he's going to be arrested and all that stuff like there's none of that in this movie no. there is nothing to make me interested in a single human on oh, screen right yeah i mean it's so so bad like um i mean okay so bill paxton plays bill helen hunt plays joe they're getting a divorce why why are they getting a divorce it 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 doesn't get established at all right it's inferred i guess that she wanted to stay in the field and he wanted to settle down perhaps yeah because he's becoming a weatherman and um i mean plus minus he had an affair with jamie gertz because it's like apparently this uh these pending nuptials are awfully rushed well yeah 
yeah, I, that's not in the movie at all. That he had an affair. No, no they do you... say they do say uh, uh, we're getting married. We need you to sign these divorce documents because we're getting married. And she's like, oh, that's sudden. Oh, but and then she's not upset. And like, yeah, she's perfectly fine. It's 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 uh... it's a prototype of a feminist heroine in a mainstream movie that I think it scores some points. I think it it does. I thought it was cool that she was sort of the badass in the movie and mm. he wasn't. Yeah. Um, I did like that when I was like, you know, 18. I was like, I kind of like that Helen Hunt's the badass sort of fearless one, even though it's like sort of male in its fearless stupidness. Right. Um, it's like definitely moronic. Right. Fearlessness. Yeah. Well, right. right. So and then. OK, so they're tornado chasers, which I remember thinking, I mean, I'm sure it's a job and everything like that, but it was just like, why? Why? I, I, I didn't know why they were doing anything they were doing. I know that it's like, oh, we got... But they have to get those balls in yeah, the tornado, Yeah, the Dorothy Gary. thing to the ball, but I was just like, but why, why do they need to do that? I mean, they do say perfunctorily, right now yeah. the average of the tornado warning before it hits is is three minutes and if we do this science we think it'll move to 15 minutes which to me is like how do you make that estimate yeah, exactly actually? right it's, but whatever yeah. i'm just saying like if I, it, you know a smarter movie would say if we could push it from three to 15 minutes we could save x number of lives yeah yeah and that's my goal in life i want to save people's lives like my dad right mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um you know so alicia friend of the show uh she said said uh, she felt like the first scene with young Helen Hunt in 1969 was very effective. I what are your not, thoughts on that? No. I thought him getting blown out of that door was hilarious. I remember <laughs> laughing at that being like, what? This is ridiculous. Because it's kind of like, ah, like It's hilarious. <laughs> and then they're just, then it's like she's just yelling at her dad and it's like if it blew him out would there not be any wind blowing them around anymore because it, it just didn't... To like... me, my problem with the scene is, is the whole point of a cellar is to be in it. Yeah, yeah. The door is a little perfunctory as far as like, you know, you're supposed to be in a ditch or whatever. Yeah, okay. So like I feel like a farmer that lives in Kansas yes. well, right. knows he doesn't have to hold the cellar door closed. <laughs> exactly. He can just go in into the cellar with his family but uh so again friend of the show alicia spiegel uh, she clapped back okay at that and she said you know you could see emotionally he felt like he needed to do that to protect them mm. and i am just not willing to go that far i feel like he would know better i, I think, think when yeah. he gets blown out in the storm it did not make me laugh <laughs> i think you're a monster <laughs> <That's> like, <laughs> I'm like seriously movie this is how you're gonna start with this guy getting blown away from the door. So I feel like this movie uh, was made for people that have a head injury. Yeah. (laughs) If if you wanted to think about anything, if you question this movie at all, it all falls apart. It's like, just sit back and enjoy the ride. And, and, uh, you know, I honestly did not think much of Philip Seymour Hoffman when I first saw this movie. But watching it now, what I feel like he's doing is is like almost literally tap dancing in every single scene to be like somebody's got to make this entertaining somebody's got to do something is nothing that, is yeah, happening yeah 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 like, <laughs> i'm gonna pretend this is the most exciting movie ever maybe some people will believe it it's the suck zone we call that the suck zone the suck zone that's what this movie is the suck zone <laughs> like, it's a it's it's a bullseye of the well, suck zone right so okay we meet all everybody we get joey slotnick 
again from Blast of the Past. Uh, and then and 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 uh, the single guy. Yes, and um, <laughs> the one uh, one of the researchers doesn't he only have one line? He has like, like two lines. Bill, what are you doing? Exactly. Here? I'm like, and, there's Joey Slotnick, never and, to be seen again. Exactly. But and so not that was a confusing part too because he's like, Bill, what are you doing here? He's like, Good to see you, Joey. And I was like, Did they not come with names for any of these people? <laughs> <laughs> like we're this is a rush production we have to get it to ilm stack exactly. everybody just goes by their names that's right except no uh bill um, helen joey just do it alan ruck is known as rabbit which is kind of like what <laughs> and it's like rabbit he has the maps exactly. and he is like a hundred percent in charge of one of the times that they drive somewhere that's and then right. every other time no rabbit no cameron <laughs> nothing exactly uh okay so they... yeah philip seymour hoffman what's his job yeah yeah he just Todd weird... field what's his job i don't know yeah exactly <laughs> Uh, they so yeah, they all drive off. Uh, so Jamie Gertz gets to go because it, so Jamie Gertz is playing a uh, stigmatizing therapist yes. from uh, a misogynist male point of view that's like anti therapy and gross, and she's like a nothing nobody cipher of a like like I guess they felt like they needed like the anti Helen Hunt in the movie well, so, so so right away this is the first thing that kind of says so like they're all kind of introducing everybody and then they get this call oh we gotta go go we gotta go and then they drive off and then we also introduce Carrie Elways, who is oh the evil weather because yeah he's the evil weather man and they almost get ran off the road and in the very next scene they're changing the tire and everyone's hanging out at this diner and I was like wait why did they all jump in their trucks to go <laughs> what was the point of that and it was really just to get Jamie Gertz to be like oh I gotta be with you now you know and it's just kind of like wait what it's a good point I forgot the diner but, but you know in this movie sometimes you end up at a diner Sometimes yeah. you end up at your aunt's house. Sometimes you end up at the drive-through, drive-in yeah, movie you theater just, like, at night just at, for no reason. Like they're just in the Oklahoma fields, and it's like, oh, we just gotta keep, we gotta come up with other places for them to go. <laughs> you know. <laughs> It's like it's it really is like a twenty minute special effects reel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That like they stretch so thin that there was like nothing holding it together. Right. Like I, I was telling Alicia, like just have anything dramatic happening other than a tornado in the movie, and it becomes more interesting. Well, right. Yeah, yeah. But no, no. They that's because the, <laughs> like the there could be it's was... May. There could be prom somewhere, and this guy is really hoping that it'll go well with this girl he has to prom and everything and all of a sudden the stars the skies go dark it's like oh shit a tornado is invading real life like that's interesting yeah but this movie is like they want to find tornadoes and they sure do find tornadoes yeah and tornadoes look real and it's like but like i don't care about that no exactly and then (laughs) then the first tornado that they're in where like that also is like i know they're lower but they they're able to hold on to this bridge while the tornado <laughs> tears apart the bridge, flips the truck over. I forgot but, that, like, essentially the entire, like, denouement or final action sequence is just a complete repeat of that sequence. Yeah, exactly. exactly. It's a little bit longer, and they have to keep running. Oh, no, let's try that building. No, let's go to that building. But but the, you got to hang on to a thing while a tornado yes. tries. To, yep. But it's like, okay, just like, for example, listen, if this movie was good otherwise, mm-hmm. I don't care that they put a belt around their waist and the tornado can't pull them up. Yes. That much has been talked about this online. And obviously, probably if it can pull a house apart, it can pull Helen Hunt apart. Yes. Yes. Right. It doesn't matter if she's wearing a belt. No. Like, you it'll would just think so. pull her body parts Exa- off yes. of each other. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> 
And so I guess the only, and I don't care, like if you can tell a really good story, it doesn't have to be like really realistically, scientifically, mm-hmm. whatever. But I think where they miss out is if you tell the scientific truth about what tornadoes can do, it makes them scarier. Yeah, right. Well, so yeah. if if it's a rated R movie where a hubcap flies and decapitates somebody and you see the brains spill out yeah. or whatever, it's like, oh, shit. Like, much scarier, like an unexpected violent thing like that would be much scarier than dad flying away with the cellar door, which, I don't know, I guess horrible people think is funny. <laughs> hilarious <laughs> check it out <laughs> you want a good laugh watch him get blown up on the solar door uh and then um, they, it, there's a lot of coffees ordered in this movie yeah. that are never delivered or drank well right <laughs> jamie gertz puts them on puts the two pepsis pepsi's also a big sponsor uh on top of the the truck and drives away uh yeah they, this is a spent. real this is a real corporate feeling thing which um, corporations are bad at Apparently, because that's like Bill Paxton <laughs> says about <laughs> Carrie Ellis. It's like he's a corporate weatherman. He's not in for the science. He's in it for the money. It's like <laughs> if he figures out how to. Okay, <clears throat> let's dissect this. If he figures out how to make tornado warnings happen 15 minutes early, yep. does it matter if he has corporate <laughs> sponsorship? No, they come to that at the end. <laughs> they come to that realization at the end. Uh, but you know, when there's like, you need to, you need to bolt it down. He's like, I'm not going to trust you. It's so much easier if you're not a fucking idiot to write it. Like this guy has a slightly different idea of how to do the science and he's very stubborn. Yes. Yep. That's yep. it. That's, That's it. all you have to do. But no, like, he's, he's. He... I have any idea what's so Michael Crichton is such a narcissist because yeah. he was a medical doctor so he thinks he knows everything but like the research world does not work this way that you I'm sorry like <laughs> yep. it would be like some other scientists that stole their idea because of they want the glory yeah. and obviously it would be better if they work together but this guy's got you know you know personality problems or whatever that's it but he's also kind of likable so then you could have seen where they do bond but then Mm -hmm. he could decide to be bad or not like it, anything, any yeah. human drama. That's all I want. It, nope, instead, it's don't... like Carrie Elway's wears all black, and a character says, "There's the bad weather man. Here's the plot description of why he's a bad weather man." Exactly. Like, yep. Oh, okay. Of course. Thank you. Yep. Uh, yeah, you're right. Then, so all the tornadoes they come up. They keep calling the dumb names for uh, the sidewinder. Oh, the finger of God. It's all these stupid oh, names. Bill Paxton for... says we. We've got sisters. That's right. Uh, it was like, oh, come on. It's so, terrible. Yeah. And it, even if it's like it was like something that tornado chasers say or, or weathermen say, like you can't just like drop that it's, and yeah, not it was address trying it. To be, you, it, it. The movie is like, look how authentic we're being because they're talking like that. And it's like, but no, you're not. No. <laughs> okay. And let me just tell you another thing I really hated. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, you know, when they're at Auntie May's house and yes. they're eating black beef and yeah, yeah. very white potatoes yes. and no vegetables. Yeah. Um, and then they give a go bag of that to Philip Zimo Hoff and he's more beef and vegetables. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, more beef and potatoes. Anyway. Um, so Jamie Gertz is like, uh, what's this F five categorization yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Of, of tornadoes? And they're like, Oh, let me tell you the story where Bill Paxton threw a bottle of whiskey into a tornado. And he's like, oh, oh." anyway, that's really dumb. Like, try again. That's like a first draft of something he did risky. Like, he needs to be a hero in the story, you idiots. Right. Anyway, then they explain it was an F2. What's an F2? What's F3? And then they talk about how bad an F4 could be. And then, like, any child would say, is there an F5? It's not a very hard conversation yeah, right and and let me tell you what scientists would say yes <laughs> there's a what's a one to five that's the worst one yeah but instead all these scientists go quiet they get quiet like oh, what we don't like talk. it's we a can't talk paranormal about it. exactly badness and it, it 
it's like hilarious. It's not how humans behave right. at all. And she's looking around like, what? What did I say? Exactly. I, did you guys not know that five is a number that comes <laughs> after four? Is, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't know this was a weird cult that I was in about tornadoes, you assholes. Yes. Yep. Just a bunch of weirdos that have like one personality characteristic why do we need this many character actors yeah. following around Bill Paxton? Could it Jer- just be Bill Paxton and Helen Hunt? Then Jeremy it's Davies? Like a... We haven't even mentioned Jeremy Davies is in there. Yeah, because he plays the Todd Field type person that also doesn't have anything he to do. He doesn't do anything, no. <laughs> And they're all good actors. It's like, obviously, Universal or Steven Spielberg or whatever has a clout to just get whoever, the best people. But they all could have been doing anything better than this. Yeah. Including Bill Paxton, who I actually love yeah. in a lot of performances. Yeah, he's but great as Brock, he just, uh, Brock Lovett. <laughs> he, yes, exactly. Are you ready to go back to Titan? Actually, the Brock Lovett part of Titanic is very similar to Twister. <laughs> it's like, imagine if the very first 10 minutes of Titanic was like was a 100-minute movie. action movie, yeah. but actually it's much less fun than that sounds. That's right. But it is. It was like a lot of dorks that just like their whole purpose is to explain something scientific and be kind of irritating until yeah. we get to the real story. Yeah. That's yeah. what I was waiting for in Twister. Can we get to the real yeah, story well, where flashback. humans are yeah, yeah. i want to see uh rose and jack dancing on the tables in the lower decks you know what i'm talking about right so yeah then they visit <laughs> the ant and they go another tornado then they get to the movie the the drive-in and... right which stand alone show that 10 minute sequence yeah, to anybody on its own they're gonna be like i want to watch this movie and i'll be like weird thing is is that you do not yeah that's right that's right <laughs> But that oh. that sequence is is really really good. I feel like there's nothing wrong with it. It it's very good use of the darkness and the storm and the uh, THX sound, which I watched this on VHS, so yeah. I know how good well, the sound the can sound, be. The sound was annoying though too because they use like like lion roars or something like that. Yeah, and it was like oh come on. Yeah, I know, oh. I know, and they don't even use it effectively because I don't think they ever personify or whatever uh, the tornadoes into a beast very effectively no. I, I, they never make me afraid of tornadoes like that's a that's the cardinal sin of this movie I'm never afraid of a tornado maybe in that first scene with the dad and everything Well, because right. it's like it does have the rushing through the house and we have to get under but they didn't even milk that as good as like Spielberg would you right. know what I'm talking about where it's like Spielberg well, would be like the dread the yeah. possibility of it all that stuff and that's they, like so and- had all these other people and like sure Carrie Ells dies at the end uh, because but it's like we need but it almost more... feels like the movie doesn't want you to feel that death did you feel that yeah it was like he died and it was like sad for a second and Helen Hunt immediately was like we did everything we could and it's like bah, 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 yeah. and they're on to the next thing it's like it, it doesn't even have the courage to kill one of the like a large like maybe like six people at once without like feeling it right and it we felt, that so felt many very people gross they actually could have killed too like you had so many you had Joey Slotnick. You had Jeremy Davies. It's like some of these guys could have died. In, I mean, and that's the a more stakes. honest movie, right? Where she's putting herself in harm's way to save lives, but Jeremy Slotnick gets decapitated. That's right. Like, that's harder for me to swallow. But, like, Carrie always obviously dies because he's bad in this yes. movie. Yes, yeah. And he her a, aunt yeah. has a house fall on her. Yes. And she's going to be fine. She's going to be okay. Yeah, she survived that they go and save her uh, like you do yeah <laughs> they don't even they just, save her with their tornado knowledge they just climb into her house and drag house her out and that's yeah and that's yeah uh, uh. and then yeah they they solve so the, the the big thing that we totally forgot about is like oh they're trying to get these uh these measurements and how and it's a good thing the ant has all these knickknacks because helen hunt's like oh we need to put these wings give me Every soda can. Every soda. Can. What do you What do you mean every Everyone. soda? Everyone. Exactly. Give me every <laughs> soda can. What do you mean every soda can? <laughs> and um, and then Bill Paxton's like and duct tape. 
And so they put all that duct tape and soda canned all Pepsi products, Pepsi, Diet Pepsi, Mountain Dew, uh, and yeah, they try to drive that into the uh, the tornado. And it's supposed to be a, sort of a like can do kind of a. Like that's, like, oh, they got over this hump, and it's like, what? I forgot they were even trying to get it. Like this was the big thing that was like, oh, we solved it. We solved and it. I do feel like that was the major thing that bothered me is like even from the earliest earliest of like screenplay or story pitch things it's like what's the goal we gotta get these balls into a tornado that's it that's the end of the movie it's like oh my god it's so short i mean like as as a movie maker you can shoot for the stars but it's like michael Crichton is such a freaking dork that he's like oh get some wind measurements yeah 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 yep yep Yep, it's dumb. It was dumb, <laughs> dumb, dumb. Boo, boo, boo. And that's the end of Twister. I mean, it was bad, Gary. It was really, really bad. And I thought it was bad back in 1996, because I do remember talking about it. I was like, it's not a good movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you and saw it twice. <laughs> So I don't think I chose it the second time on the double blind date. I just swallowed and watched it again. But I did think, okay, it was big screen. It was THX. It was uh, good special effects. It did swallow me whole, I think. You got sucked up in the suck zone. Well, I was in the suck zone, Gary. And and the thing is, is I did kind of like that it was an action movie without guns. Yeah. Uh, It was like a different different thing um honestly i just wanted it to be a better disaster movie yeah. looking at it now it's like the, come on just there are tropes you could just do the tropes and be a much better movie of yeah, like you, a disaster so and so rescue so and so so and so has to convince so and so that the thing is real yep. and then once he does everything turns and then the good guys win it's like just pick some good there's nothing in this there's nothing, nothing. the divorce no, no papers and bullshit oh my god yep. i can't stand it it's yeah, terrible it's, it's horrible it's horrible, horrible on, on a on a zero to a hundred the... scale gary helen hunt and bill paxton have negative two million charisma and yeah. romantic chemistry together right. they look they like have... they are not the same species when they look at each other it's no. like get away from me we really should have been helen hunt and uh paul reiser that would have been what i want <laughs> okay all right i guess we're gonna just this is what we're doing now exactly. we're following the storm Okay, you drive. I'm going to sit over here. All right. I guess. All right. I love you. Uh, That's right. (laughs) And, uh... No, we need Paul Reiser from Aliens. (laughs) Burke. (laughs) Yes, yes. And then then this character, whatever her name is. Uh, Joe. Joe. Joe and Burke. And then over the time uh, course of the movie, she realizes that his chest is going to burst (laughs) and there's going to be a tiny little xenomorph in the car with her. Twisters. And yeah, they decide to make a sequel a legacy sequel it's like oh yeah let's do twisters mm. i mean the first one had more than one twister so that's it's right. little intellectually dishonest that's right uh, we've right. got sisters oh, i hate it so <laughs> um all right we can rate it that we can rate yon de bond's okay. twister okay uh, give it a zero out of four stars yep. do not watch do not watch zero it's a bad movie <laughs> And I hated it. The entire history of cinema is worse for it being included in that <laughs> grouping. It right. lowers the average usefulness of watching movies. That's right. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening to another episode of my so-called podcast. Next episode, we're going to watch something that I like. Oh, yep. Okay. Sounds good. (laughs) All right. Bye, Gary. Bye, Eric.